um, interest uh, in quantum. They have uh, recently they joined 67 members. They here around three, three, uh, 340, and uh, in Boston it is around 60. So uh, almost uh, we come uh, coming close to 500 members, and uh, this is a platform for professionals to involve in quantum tech and data science to exchange knowledge and gain insight into uh, various development happening currently. And uh, apart from that, most of the uh, participants are from uh, academia, industrial sectors like uh, software and uh, some professors also, uh, they are supporting us in giving talk. So uh, this is, uh, uh, participant and uh, so we are interested to get some insight and uh, some create an innovative ideas which can be developed like uh, we have this current situation uh, which needs a lot of uh, insight from uh, experts and specialists uh, when they give 360 degree of view we can uh, develop a better solution than um, silo based development so that way, um, a lot of things can be done quickly. So that is the idea. Quantum has more powerful than supercomputers. So that has uh, Google has proved uh, supremacy recently. So that way, we have to see whether it is possible to develop something quickly than taking uh, each vaccine around ten months to develop. That has been like a software. We can do two weeks cycle. That has quantum has a power to develop that way of uh, faster response. So that is one of the idea this topic came up. So uh, we are going to present the speakers based on that. Now I hand over um, the platform to um, Virendra, who is going to moderate. Uh, Virendra, are you there? Absolutely, I'm here and ready. All right. First of all, welcome everyone and thank you Balaji. I think that's been a splendid start for the session. As you see, Balaji started with the first meetup in Bay Area and has uh, moved on and found out to Connecticut and Seattle, all the happening places. And that's the, that's the perfect way to get all the intelligentsia and the people together on the subject. And it's now three meets which he's handling a tremendous job and I have to personally thank him to get me into this meet uh, about eight months ago when we were looking for something on quantum, things happened. We got together and we started with this. But that, that's a great beginning and the group is emerging every day stronger and sm stronger with absolute good, great industry experts as we see now, top five of them here in this area for us today on this call. And I want to welcome you all. Rebecca, CEO of Quantum, absolutely welcome today, Veselin, Ronan Institute. He's been a Thank theoretical you. background for the subject and he has been coaching us how quantum physics to quantum computing and all these transitions. Thanks, uh, Veselin, for taking us there. And Vinay has been another uh, great inspiration as he got into the group and showed us some very good quantum exercises. And we'll see some of the results today as we have very limited time today. So we'll see how Vinay will uh, take us through that. Dr. Jivika, again from Oracle, hardware side, AI, ML, and quantum expert. Another great addition to our group. Uh, welcome again, everyone. And Thank of you. course, last but not the least, and I have to do special thanks to Bairo today. He has been battling a big, big escalation, guys. So big hands for him first, because in spite of that, he's here today with us. This being an amazing, amazing piece the way he has pulled it together. Thank you, Bharav. Thank you, Veselin. Thank you, Jivika. Thank you, Vinay and Rebecca. Absolutely to be with us today. So I think uh, quantum is an interesting subject as we dive into this. And we know that the COVID-19 has really taken the world by storm as Balaji just explained also and how things have been going. We are all locked in into the houses. And this 82nd day, people might say differently in different contexts, but 82nd days as it is dragged on CNBC. So looking at the economy, looking at how things are happening around and how can quantum help? We have AI, we have ML, we have technology and we have supercomputing. 
lot many things have jumped into the fray. A lot many companies, government corporates have come in here. And as I build this up, I have a simple, simple subject and question for my audience. How many of you are really interested in the quantum? And you can just type in yes. But I'll give you very, very frankly, we are all here. There are three types of quantum people in the world. One who understand, one who do not understand, and those who are like me. They say in the quantum language simultaneously, you understand or you don't. Say yes and say no. That's where we come to the qubit state, qubits. And that's where <coughs> the entanglement come, entanglement comes, and that's when we say that, okay, this COVID has really thrown us out into this situation here. We are trying to all battle it out and we have our own impacts in our own <coughs> way. But it has really been trying to give us a new etiquette now. A an etiquette in terms of stopping the spread, social distancing rules. <laughs> and the first time we have heard divided we stand, united we fail guys. <laughs> 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 it is something so unusual, but the impact is not only to corporate, impact is all over the place. It's at home life, it's at the corporate. And all of us who are saving two hours every day for driving now, they have another problem to tackle here. <laughs> right, Barrow? <laughs> I see Barrow nodding there, exactly. <laughs> because you have to do everything now, not only homework, homework, kitchen work, and also the corporate work, working from home. With, with that, I think as I go along further, this is somewhere we want to use a format today so that we are very effective. I'm jumping very quickly so that I give more time to my coveted panelists here. So we'll have main segments where each panelist will come about and they will try. And I'm trying to couple two panelists at one time so that one person followed by the second person can first substantiate what they are working together in terms of the subject. And then we will engage if there are any further additions from any of the panelists, they can always chime in there after they are done, the two panelists. Otherwise we go to the next session. And I have a request for the audience, save your questions or post them in the chat. We will definitely come to that at the end of the complete discussion, but we will not ignore. We definitely want to have those discussions. They are important. And those questions are also very important. Now the subject is a moving target, as I said, this 82nd day on CNBC. Some people might be tracking at 57th day. Different Chinese contexts, different ways, different way it has been getting tracked. And the way it is going on, if I, if I go further here, basically just to give a very high level corona virus disease, COVID-19 problem, priority is how basically we prevent this disease from spreading screen large number of appropriate, uh, uh, screen large number of suspected cases, quarantine them, save the time basically so that we can have the disease in control <coughs> and going to the challenge of laboratory testing where we get a lot of significant negative results. How can we be fast, accurate with our diagnostic methods so that we can combat this disease sooner than later? So that's where the Chinese team was in Wuhan, they, they came up with that kind of challenge. And then they were looking at how could they extract COVID-19 graphical features, basically to provide a clinical diagnostic diagnosis ahead of uh, their pathogenic tests. So from that standpoint, when they went and they finally did all the stuff, checked the images, matched it, validation, accuracy, of the results and they came to a conclusion that definitely the proof of principle which they were trying to do using artificial intelligence to extract radiological features for their timely and accurate diagnosis is something that can work. And that's where finally they went on with the idea. So our idea today is that, okay, wherever they have gone with AI and ML and modeling and everything, how can we now augment that piece as Balaji, our organizer also explained, to take it to the quantum level and to take us to that first step in this process. How do we leverage it? Can we check all this? And then can we leverage quantum? From that angle, I want to basically invite Veselin and Vinay in the segment one. 
and I want to hand it off to Vaseline to build so that we say, okay, <laughs> when this is the case, what are the quantum computers? What can they do different? How can they go about better? And can that something be really leveraged or we are still, still not yet there? With that further, no further ado, over to you, Vaseline. Uh, thank you, Virinda. Uh, can I share the screen so I can have a full screen? Uh, yes, I will, I will bring it up for your full screen. Please give me one second so that I can bring your latest slides. So that way we'll have that. And I will stop and start sharing your piece. Give me one second. Okay. I'm right here so that I can have presenter present presenter give me, mode. Give me one second. Give me one second. I'm just pulling up your slides as a PDF. That'll be easier and full screen. So Okay, thank you. Yeah, give me one second. Well, I'm on, I'm okay. <laughs> no, I'm just trying to. Um, so I wanted to point out that uh, you already seen in the news about supercomputers like the Oak Ridge one and then three other Hulk and Super Mac and Jewess that are joining in the search for cure for the virus. Um, and this is some of the pictures that you can quickly just find online by doing a search. Uh, of course, this is kind of an unprecedented pandemic um, nowadays. And uh, luckily, I mean, uh, yesterday actually I had the opportunity to watch a talk by the Berkeley professor showing where is actually this new virus standing compared to other like Cyrus, uh, bird flu, or some of the other chicken pox viruses. So with the standard computational techniques and monitoring and modeling, we have quite a good idea uh, what is the danger of the virus and how quickly it can spread. Uh, so basically, the question is usually what we can do with computers and where the computers are useful. And of course, modeling the spreading of the epidemic outbreak is important. And that's the main tool that governments have been using to decide on the measures they do. Um, another point is really knowing about the healthcare needs and resources. Do we have enough test kits? Do we have enough beds? And uh, how do we... Uh, take care of the sick people. Now, the place where really the supercomputers and quantum computers came into place is finding suitable medical cures. I mean, vaccines is one way to go, but of course there's other ways where you can try to block uh, the virus from connecting to your body cells and uh, different mechanisms. So that's one of the searches that was done in the Oak Ridge. Uh, and after this is kind of settled down, of course, there is a big question. When is the decision to make, okay, now we can go to normal life? Uh, because this is obviously not the normal life, but it could easily become the, the lifestyle that we can have to be if this virus is not contained. Uh, and how do you measure that actually we manage to suppress the effect of the virus spreading and treating the illnesses? And whatever we do at the end, there's a big question of understanding the economic impact and aftermath, uh, because uh, one thing is when people get sick and they have to go to hospitals, uh, if you overwhelm the health system, this is dangerous thing. Um, but then what happens if you overwhelm the, the economics? I mean, basically people are not uh, prepared for long, uh, prolonged uh, homework and uh, businesses are not picking up. 
uh, what happens with the economic situations, what about the breaking of the society, I mean, the, the general behavior and, and things like this. So understanding what is the effect and what measures could have been better um, would prepare us for the next pandemic. And here is one very simplified model of this uh, pandemics usually are considered uh, the people that are around that can uh, be susceptible to the virus and with sub certain rates of interaction these people get exposed to the virus um, depending on their situation I mean they can become infected with the certain rates or then go into recovery and of course this is the unfortunate uh, segment that nobody wants to be but this is the reality and through the different methods right now what we are doing is we are tackling here the rate of uh, going to exposure so we are trying to minimize how many people would be exposed to the virus uh, but then we can try to actually find if you are exposed how do you block the virus so that it doesn't affect your body I mean can we find cures like this and even if you are I mean, how do you recover quickly? Um, and this is like the vaccines, where the vaccine help, and you don't get to this unfortunate uh, death kind of end of the line, and you can recover successfully. So that's a very nice diagram of the effects of not doing uh, the measures that we see now, uh, comparing if you do the measures, and then if you do it properly, then you avoid overwhelming the healthcare. This is really important, but then we don't know what is the effect afterwards uh, of economic and social impact and, and psychology of the people. Um, basically, the way that they model also the healthcare needs is very similar models. And these are models, as you can see from the equations, they're easily handled by the modern computers. Um, and now, one of the successes of supercomputers was this um, uh, use of the Oak Ridge uh, Supercomputer IBM Summit, where um, a search was performed over 8,000 possible compounds, and 77 was found promising. So this is significantly cut, and this was done only in two days. So now you have to have to go through 77 compounds and trying to see which one of them would really be able to block the virus from interacting with your system. So oh, this is really important. It's not the vaccination. It just blocks the centers that usually connect with your cells and uh, your uh, body system with the molecules in your cells and injects the DNA so that the virus can reproduce. If you stop the reproduction of the virus this way, basically uh, you, you kind of reduce uh, this kind of line here because going from uh, exposed to infected, uh, you're shortening this period um, and preventing it. So now with our computers, we were really remarkable. I mean, the supercomputers uh, that we have today, I mean, they were envisioned about 20 years ago. And if you go to history in a more slow, how it goes, we see that right now we are kind of reaching a limit of what we can do with current classical computers and we know that we need more because there's much more that is needed to analyze large data sets um, and that's where quantum comes because quantum is quite different than the usual in a standard computer we have zero and one uh, and this is the state of a register I mean that would carry so things are true or false and that's all you can say about that uh, but in quantum uh, there is a superposition of possibilities. Any possibility that is mutually exclusive and objectively possible, then you can superimpose it. So, for example, if you have a bigger n register classical computer, you can have only two to the n possible permutations that you can analyze. And if you want to analyze what is the outcome of any specific one, it becomes very difficult to find what is the optimal kind of combination that you need. What quantum does is actually puts a superposition of all these possibilities in a way that each amplitude here in front of the possible outcomes uh, is related to a probability. And it's important 
when you have the zero and one only, I mean, there's a two parameters, but these two parameters are not arbitrary complex numbers. They have to be actually a numbers on the unit circle because this expresses that the total probability is one. That means that these are the only two outcomes that you can get when you do a measurement. Uh, but what is the state of the system is not clear until you do the measurement. So this superposition is the key thing for quantum computers. You can prepare states that the superpositions of all these classical registers run algorithm and at the end of the run, this algorithm will tell you which actually combination is the best one for whatever a particular question you're asking. Um, so there are specific um, problems that quantum computers are specific, quite uh, suitable. And these problems are particularly uh, searching in uh, uh, a large unstructured database. And ultimately, that's where we are going with the internet. Um, I mean, Google has a finite uh, capability to be able to keep organizing the data and making the search available to us and also search other search engines. Ultimately, uh, all the information out there is unstructured. And how do you find something specific out there? There is a proof that there is an algorithm that with quantum computing, you can have a very efficient quick search uh, through this unstructured database. Uh, the other problems that quantum computers can solve is very large combinatorial problems that similar like the hay, uh, the haystack. That's a lot of uh, possibilities to search through. So in a similar way, you can look at the network between people, how they are connected, and you can determine what actually uh, preventive measure are optimal for a particular outcome. So you can determine how you can cut, and this is known as max cut uh, problem where you have the different nodes and how the relationships are between them. Uh, they have some simple applications to companies where when they try to optimize their supply chain, for example, or if they want to optimize uh, how many free samples would be given out there so that customers would buy the product and so on. Uh, but particularly, this could be very useful later when we try to analyze different measures that were taken and uh, how people, organizations responded to the crisis uh, so that we'll be prepared for better uh, suggestions next time. With this, uh, I want to return the slides back um, and to Veringa. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you. We can continue. Thank you, Veslin. And let me go back to our share mode. So basically, at this stage, uh, definitely I want to give it one open quick chance for other panelists to add anything in terms of supercomputing versus quantum computing uh, before we can bring in Benef, where he will build his argument. And his argument is exactly to demonstrate to us. Uh, the examples results about classical versus quantum supremacy and how he has done that uh, experimentation using the stuff which he has been teaching at Udemy as well. He had given us earlier some sessions to that effect as well. Uh, very, very interesting session that was and we have a recording available and if anyone is interested, we can jolly well share that. But from that angle, we want to see that quantum versus classical comparison and quantum supremacy, but before that, I will open it for Rebecca, Jivika, or Bhairav, if you want to add anything in terms of what Veselin just added as his quantum computer argument. Any any comments? Otherwise, we can give it to Vinay. I have something, uh, this is Jivika. I, can, I have something in my slides, which would probably it's better to leave it to that session. Oh, sure. That yeah, we sense. can just, yeah, so that way yeah. we don't have to do something, yeah. All right, so I think uh, basically as uh, Dimitri from OLCF also said, to test quantum supremacy, we needed a well-defined computational problem, a benchmark that could run on both quantum and classical, and then observe which solved it faster. With that footing, I want to invite Vinay. Vinay, come and defend or offend his argument from Dimitri. Over to you. And I'll, I'll put your first slide up here. Vinay, you ready? Yep, so thanks Virendra. So. Yeah, definitely. I agree that whenever you have a new technology and you want to 
let's perform some sort of benchmark or if you want to just analyze why should you migrate your existing architecture or your problems on that new technology then it is very important that you have one particular problem which can be solved on both of these uh, different devices okay so my goal over here would be to provide a very high level uh, introduction to why do you actually need quantum computers to uh, maybe uh, create a molecule or create a cure for covid 19 and why do you need quantum and what is it that quantum can offer which a classical computer cannot okay so first of all uh, let's quickly go through some key differences between how a quantum computer works at the fundamental level and how a classical computer works okay so just like uh, professor said quantum computer uses qubits as the fundamental unit of compute and classical computer uses a bit so in the case of a classical computer you can have zero or one but in the case of quantum computer it can be a probability so you have 80% zero and 20% one or 50% one 50% zero so ultimately you have a probability distribution between both of the states okay then uh, after this point uh, actually a lot of different uh, quantum mechanical phenomena are something which is used by quantum computers to uh, have a better execution of some quantum circuits so let me elaborate more on this point so we quantum computers use a tool called or a phenomena from quantum physics called as quantum tunneling and quantum tunneling basically lets you scan the entire solution space and come up with a minimum approach okay so i'll come back to quantum tunneling uh, sometime later but for now we use a magical phenomena let's call it magic for now until we define it properly so we have a magical phenomena which lets us scan the entire solution space and then come up with an output so for example if you were to calculate the global minimum of a particular graph and all you had is the equation then let's look at how you would solve this problem on a classical computer and a quantum computer so the on a classical computer you have advanced tools like uh, you can calculate the derivative and finally come up with a minimum value but let's look at the simplest approach so ultimately what you would end up doing is calculate all of the output values for all corresponding inputs so if we have a simple equation where y is equal to x squared then you will calculate the output value for all the different input values of x then you will plot it on a graph and then you will uh, basically return the lowest value so over here if you want to calculate the lowest value of something or if you want to analyze a particular graph that is when you have to generate that graph based on the equation but in the case of quantum computers you somehow just feed in the equation into the, a quantum circuit and then suddenly it does some processing and then gives you the lowest possible energy state which satisfies that particular circuit so essentially when uh, you are using uh, quantum tunneling and basically uh, solving a problem where you want the minimum of a particular uh, equation that is when uh, quantum tunneling has its biggest advantage so have you considered spending a lot of time training just a machine learning model in order to decrease the loss value well quantum computers can give you a different approach where you can just plug in the entire loss equation and just wait for a few seconds and ultimately you just have a lowest energy state so this is a very important thing so whenever you want to minimize anything that is when quantum computers are very important and the phenomena which makes this happen is called quantum tunneling okay then another very important aspect is upscaling of quantum computers is linear as the complexity of the problem increases linearly so basically what i mean is that if the problem becomes twice as difficult then a quantum computer would take twice the amount of time to solve it in an ideal scenario and we'll uh, look at this in the next slide but in the case of classical computers 
most of the time the approach is exponential whenever we have simulation type problems so if the problem becomes twice as difficult then it takes us four times as much time to solve it okay so ultimately the key takeaway from this slide is basically quantum computers try to exploit a lot of different uh, quantum level effects uh, of quantum physics and quantum mechanics and classical computers have to work somewhat on a classical physics domain so next slide yeah so this is a slide from a, a benchmark which i had conducted at zen4 quantums so ultimately we formulated one single problem and then solved it on a classical computer and a quantum annealer so a quantum annealer is a certain uh, type of device which actually lets you uh, find the minimum of a particular equation okay so over here the problem which we were trying to solve was a graph problem and the graph problem basically consisted of a minimum voltage cover solution so ultimately you encounter these type of problems in a lot of different areas so like network analysis people interaction and this problem is very important right now in this particular scenario about covid 19 and that is because we need to somehow modulate all of the interactions between different uh, groups and then actually get us some analysis of how this virus is about to spread okay so with this the problem which we were trying to solve was a minimum voltage problem and ultimately for a classical computer mm -hmm. you need to go through all of the different possible combinations of different vertices on that particular graph and then come up with a solution but a quantum computer somehow does this linearly so over here as uh, if you can look at the graph that is when uh, you can first of all see a yellow line and this yellow line indicates a classical computer and as you can see the growth is always increasing or the time required to solve a particular problem and the number of nodes are basically the number of vertices in that particular graph so as the number of nodes increases the number of uh, permutation combinations between them also increase and thus the solution space for a classical computer increase increases so ultimately if you look at it a quantum computer can achieve something in a linear fashion as opposed to an exponential fashion so initially if you can look at it then a classical computer is a lot faster because it takes less time to solve that problem but later on as we cross the 16 uh, node barrier that is when a quantum computer starts taking up Uh, less time as compared to a classical computer and again there are a lot of different aspects over here so in the first few runs a lot of time is consumed by the network communication so i was using d wave over here and so ultimately the problem which i was deploying was somehow converted into a model which was then sent to a d wave a quantum compute quantum annealer then the results were executed and then sent back to me so a certain amount of networking delay is also present in the first few readings and that is why quantum computer is taking more time but essentially after uh, some time we overtake that network delay and now a uh, classical computer is slower so according to me this sort of analysis is very important whenever you want to tackle real life problems like uh, working for a real solution in covid 19 so over here you can get a good idea of what tool should you use and when should you use what type of tool and what result can you expect from it next slide so i'm just putting a small uh, for the benefit of our audience uh, when i before we move to the next slide could i request you to just differentiate between your quantum computer and annealer category specifically just so that they understand the difference yeah sure so a quantum computer basically lets you plug in uh, any sort of circuit on it so you can have different quantum gates you can have different quantum operations 
but a quantum annealer just lets you do one simple task which is find the minimum of any given equation and creating a quantum computer a quantum annealer is easier as compared to creating a quantum computer so that is why we were using quantum annealers because over here we wanted to find the minimum number of vertices which are required to solve this problem so basically the difference is uh, you can find a minimum in one case and in the other case you have a very general approach so quantum computer is a very general approach where you can create any sort of circuit on it so a quantum annealer can be thought of as a subset of quantum computers perfect thank you thank you very much that's very helpful let's go to the next one yep so until now i guess we spent some time understanding and creating a foundation of quantum computers so now let's look at why should we use quantum computers for uh, something like drug discovery and uh, why should you actually be considering a quantum computer so first of all the very important uh, criteria in the case of quantum computers is that they are very good at simulating stuff and again that is because they increase linearly as the complexity of the problem increases linearly so suddenly if you are simulating 10000 different particles then you have to simulate the interaction between each one of them one by one but this is handled uh, linearly in the case of quantum computers so if you want to create a different type of drug then ultimately you need to simulate that particular virus on a breeding environment and after doing that type of simulation that is when you can create a drug which can actually affect that particular virus at that particular domain so another very important aspect is parallelized constraint satisfaction so in the case of quantum computers you can have a variety of different aspects which can be customized to get the output that you want so the first aspect can be finding the minimum energy level the second aspect can be finding the spins or finding the electron state of a particular qubit or the third aspect could be finding just a different uh, approach of uh, working on a problem which can be parallelly distributed so until now based on the introduction of quantum computers what the state of quantum computers currently is is that we cannot use quantum computers to solve a complete problem all by itself ultimately we need a classical computer somewhere so right now instead of thinking of quantum computers as a stand alone device you can think of it as an accelerator to quantum to classical computers so we have a gpu which stands for a graphics processing unit we can have a qpu which stands for a quantum processing unit okay and another different uh, factor in the case of quantum computers is that they use a probabilistic approach so anything is always present in terms of probability because of the fundamental nature of how a quantum computer is created which is a qubit and again it is a probability between 0 and 1 so essentially whenever you look at the output of a quantum computer that is when it collapses into any one state but if you run it for enough iterations you also get some approaches which are different from normal so if you have a lower probability of something happening then in that case it certainly does not mean that it will happen by having a good chance but still it has a low chance of happening and then we have a lot of different events also popping up so whenever you are doing material simulation with quantum computer you can have different type of behavior which is exhibited on the same hardware and this is something which is very interesting then another different aspect of quantum computers is that you have directional compute and let me elaborate more on the directional compute aspect by giving a real life example okay so let's say you have a cup of warm coffee and now you keep it out in the open so let's say it is somewhere at the 60 65 degrees range and the room temperature is 29 so now as you spend time keeping this cup of coffee in the open 
it suddenly starts losing temperature or losing thermal energy and it slowly comes to the room temperature and this is newton's law of cooling but then on the other hand let's look at a cold cup of coffee which is uh, colder as compared to the room temperature and if you keep it out in the open then slowly it will start absorbing energy so in the first case you have something which lost energy and in the second state you have something which gained energy and this is again going towards the room temperature which is a state of stable equilibrium but again this is something which is present at a more complicated scale but in a quantum computer where you have directionality and that is why you can save a lot of compute based on the directional compute algorithm so after that one very important aspect is scalability so whenever you are deploying a program on a quantum computer then if you want to create more uh, scenarios of that same program then it can be done easily on a quantum computer where you simply change the circuit and then work on it so after that one last aspect is data persistence and this is basically something where you can program a quantum computer in a circuit and later on when you want to run it on a different circuit instead of changing everything you can just change one aspect so with this uh, we can use quantum computers to basically get a good sense of uh, how to tackle uh, the covid 19 problem but ultimately i have modulated a workflow which i would like to look at in the next slide yeah, can you change the slide yeah okay so ultimately this is a workflow diagram which is a quantum and classical hybrid machine learning model and ultimately what this basically does is it creates a quantum circuit or it creates a quantum model and it also creates a classical model and whenever both of these model work models work together that is when we can expect some good results from it so essentially if you want to create a cure for covid 19 first of all you would have to find a certain way to simulate this particular problem on a quantum computer then the second aspect in which you use a quantum computer is when if you want to simulate the communications between different humans so if you consider humans as a particle system then the entire world is one big uh, object consisting of multiple particles so now you can simulate the interactions between these particles and then ultimately you can also simulate what would be the growth curve or what would be the exact state of any pandemic going down the line so not just drug discovery but also providing insightful analysis is also a very important part of quantum computers and ultimately suddenly there is so much data which is generated on covid 19 or corona virus and making sense from this data is again a very important task but whenever uh, you are using a hybrid quantum machine learning model that is when you can make sense of this data and ultimately you never know there is a lot of fake information flooding out everywhere but amidst this fake information somewhere we might also be sharing a real way to actually stay safe from this virus and finding that needle in the haystack as professor said is a very important aspect over here so making sense of a large amount of data and finding a tiny bit inside of it to actually work on and give us a valid solution so till now the entire purpose of my talk was to just provide a very high level overview and not get into the technicalities but i hope uh, that this was digestible and you at least have a good idea of why quantum computer should be used yeah over back to you virendra thank you so much vinay i think that has been fantastic and professor and vinay you have just done fantastic job setting up this foundation for us where i will give one chance or if you want we can go directly over to the segment 2 with uh, dr jeevika and uh, rebecca the idea is next if they can help us build their thoughts on how qc for covid 92 as uh, professed by wesselin and 
when a variable that yes, they can be used, they can be leveraged where we are or how we can maybe leverage to help control this outbreak, how this problem can be tackled at the generic level for virus strain study and make a difference for getting to the resolution of the problem. Whether modeling using AIML or whatever way towards taking it to the quantum dimension for risk, risk mitigation of these viruses. So with that, we know that there are phase one trials going on. So we'll first start with Dr. Rebecca and she will take us through the next segment to see how it can be drilled further down. Dr. Jivika, over to you. Oh, okay, <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Virendra, and hello, everyone. Uh, you, can you guys hear me well? Yeah. So, uh, so although a, a quantum computer that is capable of curbing the spread of this, uh, uh, the, this current coronavirus isn't really available yet, uh, I really believe that they have an enormous uh, power to stop any potential pandemics in the future. What I mean is even before they get started. So in a very high level, uh, like properties like superposition and entanglement in quantum computers can help simulate very complex materials and molecules that are difficult to simulate uh, with the current uh, classical computers that we have. So uh, this could help us understand uh, molecules, uh, materials or living cells and uh, potentially allow us to create better ways to curb any uh, future outbreak similar to what we are going through right now. So uh, they can, uh, these quantum computers uh, eventually can analyze the enormous amount of data and provide better and safer methods to treat uh, uh, another outbreak and they can predict and forecast various scenarios that uh, rely on uh, large and complex uh, data sets. And also uh, they can match uh, patterns and predict uh, their behavior. So uh, if you go to the next slide, Virendra. Uh, so uh, when it uh, comes to quantum computing, optimization is something that, it, that they are really good at. Uh, optimization means uh, basically to find the best solution to a problem among many uh, solutions we will have. Uh, for an example, uh, quantum computers can optimize outbreak dynamics and outbreak control into a decision support tool to mitigate uh, pandemics that spread through societies. Uh, and uh, with the massive uh, parallel computing capabilities that they have, we can find future detections and therapeutic applications from genome screens, like in this case, uh, it's RNA for coronavirus, uh, as well as uh, DNA for other cases, um, to also to help uh, mitigate supply chain disruptions. For an example, we can optimize supplies of uh, disposable N95 filters uh, the, or the uh, filtering phase pieces. Uh, for respiratory respirators, which is commonly known uh, or called as N95 uh, respirators, when there is uh, a limited supply av available. So uh, similar to what uh, uh, actually we are experience experiencing right now with the coronavirus uh, outbreak. So um, we can, uh, just like that, we can help allocate uh, outbreak control resources to identify the most robust uh, border control policy that can be implemented in the early stages of an outbreak. Uh, and we also can ensure effective and efficient testing uh, uh, that could be done during uh, the outbreaks with uh, algorithms that can detect infections, differentiate uh, COVID-19, for an example, from the common flu and uh, other um, like uh, respiratory illnesses that, uh, that people are experiencing this day. and uh, also we can optimize distribution distribution of uh, pandemic uh, influenza antiviral drugs and also explore the most effective dosing regimens uh, for drugs 
So these are the kind of things that uh, with the optimization capability of quantum computers that we could use. And if you go to the next slide, Virenza, I can talk about the other stuff as well. So, um, where do the uh, quantum computers actually fit in when we have an outbreak similar to the coronavirus coronavirus that we experience right now? For an example, uh, the fastest supercomputer, uh, which is the IBM Summit, uh, with the power of 200 petaflops, uh, which means a computing speed of about 200 quadrillion calculations. Oh, did you change this? Okay, 200 quadrillion calculations per second. Uh, uh, it, uh, it cannot calculate an optimal distribution route in a reasonable time. Uh, however, uh, when we have entangled qubits that are in superposition together with the quantum algorithms, uh, we could determine the best route at once. So um, uh, we can uh, use this uh, for, uh, for an example for route management with quantum computers, similar to the traveling salesman problems uh, that we can solve. Uh, which is actually the shortest route that travels through each city exactly once and return uh, to the departure point at the end of uh, the tour. So in big city, uh, in big cities spanning thousands of routes, the selection process is simply too complex for, for an average computer to take on. So quantum computers can show the most efficient route possibly for distributions and also for optimizing routes like this would uh, uh, be beneficial for services, especially when there are infectious diseases, uh, uh, disease pandemics that spread through a large number of cities or countries. And uh, so if you go to the next slide, uh, uh, because uh, I mean, uh, because of the parallel computing capability of quantum computers, they can also simulate very large molecules uh, since it need to account for every electron 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 repulsion and every attraction of the electron of the nuclear the largest atomic cluster uh, we can simulate on a supercomputer today has only about eight atoms i believe so with each uh, atom added this number grows exponentially so currently without a massive uh, parallel computing capability in the that is uh, in, uh, available not available in the classical uh, computers things like the new dna or rna sequencing data the learning of the specific types of protein involved in virus outbreaks and the search of uh, search for new drugs and vaccines are being uh, held back so that's why when uh, the uh, the when President Trump uh, asked if uh, the pharmaceutical companies if they could uh, have the vaccine for coronavirus available by before the elections, I mean, he was very disappointed to see that it is not something that can be done right now with the available uh, capabilities we have, you know, and special plus the, all the clinical trials that we have to go through. So, um, uh, because of the uh, because quantum computers actually can simulate in parallel, we can get better and accurate results than the approximate guesswork uh, that we are doing today with uh, the classical computers. So I have uh, one more slide, I believe, uh, if you go to the next one. Yeah, so I just want to end, the, uh, end this with uh, database search and pattern matching. I think Rebecca is going to talk more into this with further details, but just uh, just as a highlight, uh, for an example, uh, quantum computers are good at uh, searching data for unstructured databases to predict outbreaks and uh, track infectious diseases. So medical imaging and pathology, for an example, would benefit tremendously from quantum computers to train uh, machine learning algorithms uh, to identify diseases in a, in a fraction of the time that it takes the classical computers uh, uh, today. Uh, and uh, an excellent genome sequencing, which would enable more effective treatment. And uh, also quantum computers will help connect uh, previously um, unconnectable dots in uh, clinical trials to cure future uh, pandemics. So uh, these kind of machine learning tools have tremendous potential 
and they can train a system on a set of images to classify uh, the difference. Uh, in, in the case of personalized medicine, for, exa for an example, quantum computers could tell us something about per the person's genome and that makes them a, a responder or non-responder to a certain drug. So, I mean, these are just some examples that I came up with and uh, right now, for now, that's all I have. And I think you can, uh, uh, Rebecca, you can go ahead, or Vinay, if you have any, uh, if you have any questions. Or, I no. have just one simple question, and I just want to lighten up this uh, atmosphere also a bit. Entanglement is always a fun thing to understand. Yeah. <laughs> and entanglement, the moment they say, uh, it's very easily understood also when I was reading something, and it's like, if you have two socks, the moment you put the left socks on, automatically the other one becomes the right socks, correct? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so see, one thing that's which the funny thing. I, Professor, let me complete my question and then I'll allow you to absolutely react to that mm -hmm. as well. <laughs> so, I, I, I saw your comment about entangled qubits and quantum algorithms, which could determine the best route at once. Elaborate that a bit more in the context of entanglement, if you think it is uh, uh, simple enough for this forum. Let's, let's go that route, just that simple. Yeah, so basically, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, super, as I mentioned, in, uh, super, uh, superposition and entanglement, are, those are the uh, uh, like specific things that uh, quantum computers have. Right? And entanglement is the one that actually gives the real superpower for all the um, calculations or the, the things power. that the quantum computers have. Power, I'm right? sorry, can, can you hear me? Secret power, Secret power which you and Vinay was mentioning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and uh, entanglement allows the qubits to interact instantly. So when they are, um, uh, uh, like, let's say when the uh, qubits that are in superposition, when they are entangled, like basically it's like uh, doing everything in parallel, you know, you could um, uh, do perform all the mathematical operations uh, in parallel and uh, on superposed uh, and the entangled point. qubits, yeah. So that's what you get the superpower. And that's one of the reasons why we can do so many things uh, with the quantum computers uh, that we cannot do with the uh, classical computers. Absolutely. I think I will let now Professor Wesselin add because he's the right person with entanglement and the theoretical physics. Yeah. Professor, <laughs> I come to you now. Absolutely. Yeah, Please go uh, ahead. I, didn't want to stop I, I wanted just to comment that the things that are the hardest to understand are the things that we face every day. Uh, <laughs> yeah. If you start thinking about how you're breathing, you'll get trouble, right? <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> or how true. you're walking. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, it, it's the same thing, right? I am scared. I am not scared. This is what our QUB situation is in terms of the current COVID-19 situation. So it's the same thing. I understand. I do not understand. That's back to quantum fundamentals. But with that, Professor, you have to add anything more. Otherwise, we can go on to Rebecca. Yeah, let, let's go and have Rebecca now. Okay, sure. Thank you. Rebecca, you are on. And absolutely, I know you want to uh, keep things at a high level. So at high level, uh, give us your wisdom about COVID-19, quantum ML, and however we want to see if that can be leveraged more. Please go ahead, Rebecca. Absolutely, yeah, thank you so much for having me today. Um, so, so the other panelists have done a really amazing job of explaining the power of quantum computers and some of the use cases that we can, um, we can work on applying them to. So I'm, I'm actually gonna take kind of a, a different approach and come at it from more the AI standpoint. And, uh, and I know there are a lot of people attending today who are already quantum experts, but I'm gonna I'm gonna speak more to those who are um, who are trying to get into it and might be interested in implementing something themselves. So um, so kind of a practical step by step in a sense. Let's look at the problem. Here's how we might apply AI, and here's potentially where we could use quantum computing to augment that AI as well as um, work on some of those intractable problems like the panelists mentioned. So. Um, my background's in AI, and that's how I ended up in quantum computing. And so I love, I love to look at problems from the standpoint of how would a human solve this? And if you had a million little, little brains like yourself, how might you go about solving it as well? 
Um, but I think really when we're talking about anything, it's important to start with the problem rather than provide a solution for a problem that doesn't necessarily exist yet, right? And I think we could, uh, when it comes to quantum computing, we run into a little bit of that. So taking this, this, this global pandemic that we're facing right now, let's look at what the, um, what, what the problems are that we're facing when it comes to COVID-19. So I actually spoke with a number of um, friends and people working in the medical field right now. Um, and they brought up issues of, there's so much data being produced. There's a data volume challenge, right? And I think on one hand, a lot of those data volume challenges could probably be addressed with classical machine learning, but then you get into those that are so complex and you run into those combinatorial optimization or combinatorial explosion issues where we'd probably need something like a quantum computer. Um, there's also, uh, so if, you know, if you're a developer and like to look at these problems, maybe you've seen that the government and other foundations have also started releasing um, releasing data sets and challenges. So they're actually posing to us the problems that they want us to solve, which I think is really cool because we've never before been in a state where, uh, in society where there's been a big issue like this one. And organized bodies can actually go to the public and crowdsource solutions by giving out data and saying, hey, build some cool models, use some cool algorithms, and help us solve these problems that they're facing. Um, there are data sets uh, on, um, updated daily on people that have been diagnosed with COVID-19, really detailed age, uh, location, symptom onset, etc. cetera. Um, there are others where they're open sourcing all about, um, there, there's one called the Open Research Data Set Challenge, and they're releasing 30,000 papers that um, that detail any research potentially related to um, this novel coronavirus. So um, they're asking for us, the public, to, uh, to use natural language processing to look at all of these papers, because no human can actually go through these 30,000 papers and remember exactly what is in each of these different papers and connect the dots, right? So using natural language processing, and they're asking very specific questions, right? What do we know in this body of knowledge about vaccines, um, therapeutics, risk factors, transmission, incubation, et cetera, right? Um, so this is, this is how we frame the problem. And we look, at, uh, we look at data sets like that. And thinking in terms of classical AI, we can address them in certain ways. Um, when it comes to something like natural language processing, there's, uh, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but there, there is a good body of work, uh, growing work, using adiabatic or annealing, as I think um, Vinay talked about, to apply, um, to apply machine learning to natural language processing, which is very cool. But I, I think um, I'd like to take a step back again and really say, um, you know, as Vinay also outlined, what does it mean to use AI and quantum computing right now? And what does it mean? The, the biggest question that I get asked personally, um, because I work in quantum computing, uh, my company implements machine learning and quantum computing together. Biggest question I get, right, and you guys have probably heard this, what can a quantum computer do better than a classical computer? And, uh, and as the previous panelists have mentioned, that's a really hard question to answer. And it's, it's a bit in the realm of asking, what can a neural network do better than a calculator, right? It's just, it's apples and oranges. Um, and while yes, we are very early in quantum computing, especially when it comes to um, like gate-based universal quantum computing, there are actual use cases where we've seen advantage and you can you can look at a lot of papers and see proven advantage, especially using using things like annealers. And I think that just the fact that we can claim um, that we can claim certain types of advantages using quantum computing to solve optimization problems to solve things like this is uh, it's very cool. And I think that really speaks to the idea that we are in the very early days of quantum computing, and 
we don't know what we don't know, right? So that might be a little bit of a ramble, but it's all really to say that I think um, we're looking at a blank slate, not, uh, not sort of an impossible hill to climb when it comes to quantum computing. We're ready to take on these problems. And uh, in the same sense that when computers were, were very, very young, we had no idea what we were going to use them for, right? They couldn't have imagined all the things that we've been able to build today from Siri to um, the internet, right? And that's one of the biggest challenges when it comes to quantum computing. We have scaling up hardware, of course, but we also have what are the algorithms we're going to come up with? What things are we going to build with this and how do we apply it? So something like COVID-19 and this global, ep this global pandemic gives us the opportunity to look at the problem and to say, okay, uh, how can I adapt what I know about quantum computing and AI to this novel problem and come up with things that we might not have been able to think of before given this, you know, and I, I don't want to call this an opportunity, right? This is obviously terrible what's happening, but it presents an opportunity to do better next time. Um, right. And then it, I think another panelist really talked about this, but when it comes to, um, when it comes to quantum, uh, quantum and machine learning for the next probably decade, it's going to be, it's going to look like hybrid models, right? We're going to have classical working in tandem with quantum computers. And there's, um, there's actually a number of things, uh, you can, you can use today. Um, Alphabet X just came out with a really cool uh, TensorFlow Quantum. And that is really focused around using classical hybrid quantum models. Uh, so you can use classical TensorFlow and then you can build these quantum models. There's also Xanadu has Penny Lane, right? Um, and if you, can actually, if you can dive in and use these things, um, take a look at papers that have been published, you can, we, we can, I believe, start getting advantages over classical, um, classical alternatives when it comes to coronavirus. And we can use these things where we are analyzing data in a, in a quantum way or a classical way to help improve our quantum models going forward for the next times that, uh, that we face these kinds of things. Um, I do also want to, since no one else has touched on this before I, I close out, I do want to touch really briefly on quantum sensing and the potential of quantum sensing. And uh, just for everyone out there, while quantum computing gets a lot of the attention, there's really three branches of uh, quantum information technology. There's quantum computing, there's quantum communications, and there's quantum sensing. And quantum sensors are generally speaking these small devices that use kind of what you could call qubits, um, but really leveraging quantum mechanical properties to build smaller and much, much more sensitive sensors. Um, and these are really, really cool and show a lot of potential in a lot of different areas, especially in medicine. So there are different companies using them to uh, build much better images of the brain of the heart. So you could imagine taking these to the realm of medical imaging for something like this could be incredible. Um, there's another company that's working on making MRIs 10,000 times faster with quantum sensing. So um, this is very, very cool. Um, we can potentially look at it as more interest or more advanced than quantum computing in some ways. And uh, these will ultimately have to work together with quantum computers, because the data that we'll get out of quantum sensors is going to be quantum in nature, right? So, um, so that really ties back in. We need to be able to find these, these models and use quantum computing and quantum machine learning in order to look at these massive novel data sets and, uh, and really understand the world around us in a better way and how we can solve problems that we couldn't before. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I think that's been a fantastic insight into not only quantum, quantum computers, but the way you touch quantum communication, sensing and everything. That's very, very insightful. Thank you so much. And at this stage, we are almost ready to now invite Barrow, right? 
Um, hi, Virendra. Thank you. Uh, give me one second, Virendra. Let me build this slide for you as you have no really taken up this challenge and regeneron piece, which they have been trying to do yes. for COVID-19. Right? So that, that's where <laughs> that's I have to put in. And thank you so much for accepting my request. That yes, regeneron, no thank you, regeneron, yeah, regeneron CEO. And the way they were trying to move forward this time, and they were trying to basically leverage the same kind of approach when they treated Ebola and using the same kind of uh, approach for mice and use, using that human-like immune system to proteins in the virus to create antibodies. And now we see that this test is really taking a lot of uh, kind of impetus to move forward and get some more results. And even South Korea was ahead in testing antibodies to get some help. So with that piece, yes, you wanted to go this piece and while Bhairav and I were discussing and we said, no discussion can be complete. No job is done until paperwork is done. And in this entire bigger picture, which we have discussed so far, and as Bhairav is nodding already, the data science is the most important aspect to enable whether computing, supercomputing, quantum computing, whatever way. And from that angle, when it comes to Bhairav, this is like his speciality, his expertise. And I said, Bhairav, we have to hear from you this piece of the story. And thanks to Bhairav, he accepted that request. And with that, no further ado, it's all yours, Bhairav. All right. take it. Thank you, Virendra, appreciate that. So <clears throat> as we all know, uh, thank you everybody. Uh, this was very enlightening to me and uh, the quantum computing is relatively new for me. I've worked with Balaji for a long time, almost we go back three years now, and we have done a lot of uh, workshops and uh, uh, Hacker Dojo events with Balaji uh, in 2016, 17 timeframe. So um, uh, he invited me and again, appreciate uh, all of you to make, make me part of your, your um, uh, very interesting group. So uh, what has happened, uh, you know, this is like a unbelievable thing. You know, I was in, I was in China, in fact, in, uh, end of December, I was there and I, I, couldn't, I didn't see it so much, you know, I didn't see nothing, no activity. I was not in the uh, epicenter area. I was in, I was in uh, mainly in the south uh, near Hong Kong, but I didn't see a lot of, uh, you know, activity. And suddenly like end of December, we start seeing um, all these news and uh, I was quite surprised. And now with Italy and US, um, it's quite surprising. So, uh, so you know, I'm starting off here uh, showing the uh, elephant in the room here, uh, showing the, uh, the COVID-19, uh, you know, virus. Um, it goes into like angstroms, if not, if not nanometers. It's very, very small. And uh, it has these tentacles uh, that, uh, that get hold of your host cells. And then that's how it penetrates into your, uh, into your cells and then replicates into millions uh, and the right-hand side photo is, in fact, uh, one unfortunate uh, death that happened. Uh, they took a CT scan after that, and it shows uh, how the lungs are damaged by uh, coronavirus. Uh, so can you go to the next slide? Next slide, Yabrindar. Yeah. Yeah, so um, what is going on right now, you know, the symptoms we have is uh, fever, fatigue, dry cough, and then uh, you have other symptoms. Uh, it kind of takes over all your uh, immune system um, and uh, onset, of, uh, onset of pneumonia, basically. You know, it's like start, start killing your lungs in the alveoli. So the, it's quite severe. I mean, it's one of the most cont contagious disease out there today. Uh, it has taken around 10,038 lives in last 24 hours. 1,100 people have died due to this. In the United States, uh, you know, it's quite uh, bad, especially in the Santa Clara Valley where we live here. Uh, it's one of the hot spots after New York, and now it's in all 50 states, and it's growing. Uh, the the pattern we see it's the same pattern as Italy. The slope of the line, if you look at it from uh, from the infection point of view, it's the same slope as Italy. So it's kind of uh, uh, unfortunate and scary out there today. Okay, go to the next slide. Uh, so we have had uh, many pandemics uh, in the past or epidemics. Uh, starting from uh, Marburg in 1967 to Ebola in 1976, 
from bats. And then we had Nepal in 1999 in Malaysia, um, which was uh, uh, out of um, uh, another animal that, uh, you know, uh, similar to bat, uh, they call it Nepal. And then uh, we have uh, SARS in 2002 uh, from bats and other animals, transfer to other animals. Then uh, H H5N1 bird flu in China in 2003, then MERS in 2012. Uh, if out of Middle East and uh, out of camels and bird flu H7N9 out of China in 2013. And then uh, we had other disease like the H1N1 out of US uh, in 2009. And then uh, we have seasonal flus uh, all, all the time, yearly from birds and pigs. And then ongoing coronavirus, um, the source is still controversial. They have not even able to find, but it looks like it came from bats also. So you see the, um, uh, the extent of infections today. We, we started from China, uh, like if we track from February 3rd to today, uh, it just, uh, we thought that by end of Feb, everything is go looking good and everything is gonna go away. But uh, suddenly it just took off uh, in the uh, uh, last couple of weeks. Uh, and now we are at the highest peak um, since, uh, uh, you know, since January right now outside of China. And biggest is in Europe today, UK and Italy and uh, Spain to be uh, the top countries. And then US is still very small, but uh, it is growing very fast. So please, next slide. So uh, this slide uh, briefly I want to talk about is uh, 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 that uh, this, this disease is most infectious among all the contagious diseases we have seen over the last uh, few years. And um, uh, we are seeing the uh, rapid spread uh, of this virus. So you see that the, um, the rate, the basic reproduction number and uh, is much higher than any other, um, any other uh, epidemics we have seen. Next slide. Uh, next, yeah. So you see that uh, the activity, human activity has reduced significantly um, due to this and it's quite alarming. I have never seen in my lifetime of last 40 years I have not seen uh, this type of, uh, uh, you know, shutdown, um, you know, of uh, economic activity uh, around the world. Um, it's quite unprecedented and it shows up in the, in the emission levels. Uh, the air is much cleaner because, uh, but then the, um, the collateral is in the economic markets, you know, uh, the stocks are, uh, are going down and people are losing jobs and uh, it's kind of put a big break on the economic activity of the biggest expansion um, a human being had seen, that is the US economy in the last 10 years have uh, taken a big beating out right now, especially if you own blue chip stock, you know uh, what's going on. Next slide. So, uh, so here uh, it shows uh, that uh, compared to the normal flu, the incubation time is around 14 days. And now we kind of start the Regeron discussion from our now on. And uh, these, these are important numbers, like 14 days, the COVID-19, 14 days, and the infection rate, that a flu can go to maybe 1% from another person, but COVID-19, it goes to almost three people. Uh, one, one person can infect up to three people because the, how exactly the infection is spreading. And uh, uh, it, it, this thing compares the two uh, very well, the 14-day incubation time and uh, the flu versus infectious rate of the COVID-19. Next slide. And it also infects more older people. So now we go back to the uh, Regeron discussion. So what is going on right now is the Regeron is, uh, is one of the Regeneron and Sanofi uh, are at the forefront of uh, uh, you know, know this, uh, this research right now, right? Um, so they have two approaches. One is through the antibody generation, and another one is through the cytokine um, uh, treatment, right? So the cytokines are uh, are the uh, antibody antibodies or um, uh, you know um, uh, antibodies that are generated when uh, when ex when the uh, coronavirus infects the cell, it dumps uh, its genetic payload. Uh, a single strand of RNA containing the recipes uh, for making the uh, proteins it needs to duplicate into its host. The immune system mobilizes to kill infected cells before too many copies of the virus can be made. 
So, but sometimes that defense mechanism overreacts and not only uh, uh, are sick cells killed, but healthy ones also are killed in that process. So that's why people get sick and uh, you know, that they have multiple organ failures. So if the patients have high level of cytokines, they call it IL-6, um, the suggesting that inflammation is sort of ramped up, but they are not that sick yet. Maybe that's a good time to intervene. And they are using this drug called uh, Kevzara. Kevzara is, uh, is an arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis drug that they give that drug um, at that time, exactly when the inflammation is high. And uh, that, um, that kind of uh, helps. They call it Kevzara, the interleukin uh, IL-6, IL-6 in receptor antagonist approved by FDA in 2017 for the arthritis treatment to treat adults with moderately or severe active rheumatoid arthritis. So they are trying to use that uh, for overactive inflammatory response in the lungs of patients with severely damaged um, uh, you know, um, a lung system. So that, that is the uh, a cure or, or treatment they are, um, they are offering to right now. They have clinical trials going on. And go to the next slide. And they, uh, so uh, in 2018, Regeneron also is doing other study right now um, with this. Uh, the first one uh, is already 300 patients have been given this, um, this treatment in US and they are showing good results. And then uh, Regeneron uh, has another uh, clinical trial that's going on through antibodies. Uh, this is uh, when, for the Ebola treatment. Uh, in 2018, outbreak of Ebola, Regeneron quickly developed uh, a, a solution promising monoclonal antibody triplet that's, uh, that's now under review by US FDA. So this is very, very successful clinical trial they did for, uh, for the Ebola treatment. So now they are isolating uh, hundreds of neutralizing antibodies of the COVID-19 virus from uh, human, humanized mice uh, models. And they are applying it to and from humans um, who have recovered from COVID-19. And they are trying to give those antibodies uh, to the patients. The goal is to select the top two antibodies for the cocktail therapy, which can either be administered um, uh, to at-risk people before exposure as a vaccine or a treatment for those already infected. Right? So all coronavirus have cell surface protein called uh, spike protein. So the first slide, I showed you those spike proteins that uh, tag on to these cells. It helps the virus binds to the host cells. So this exactly this antibody will target the spikes protein in an attempt to uh, dismantle it so that uh, it's able to, uh, uh, it's able to get uh, the infection uh, in control, right? So it target the spikes and block the interaction of virus with the host. So that is the Regeneron um, um, very successful treatment uh, they are trying clinical trials on. The next slide. So there are other treatments out there. Uh, people are trying, the uh, Gilead Science have the, um, um, uh, the, the drug they have for the originally for Ebola treatment. They are trying to apply that to, uh, to SARS, uh, sorry, COVID-19 and they have seen mixed results. The Fuji film, uh, uh, a vegan, is uh, being used in Seattle right now. Uh, 30 patients have gone through that in Seattle. And then Sanofi uh, Kevzara, as I explained earlier, with uh, Regeneron, they are doing um, a lot of work in that area. So all of these are um, uh, drugs that are being reused. Others are uh, the Remedisivir. Uh, it's a Japanese uh, drug um, that's, all, that's used for uh, flu uh, type of, other flu type of, uh, and then chloroquine for malaria chloroquine phosphate and aluvia and uh, Kevzara. These are the different drugs being used today to cure um, COVID-19 and they have seen mixed results. And in fact, our president yesterday took some of these names and uh, there were a few other uh, uh, um, the FDA um, um, directors were there and they agreed uh, that they are trying all these different drugs for treatment. Next slide. <clears throat> So these are some of the um, drugs that are being tried on. So they are like viral RNA dependent RNA polymerase. Uh, these are already existing drugs, uh, viral protein expressions. Um, and then next slide. 
Uh, it shows um, other uh, type of treatment uh, they are trying uh, uh, with the with the um, COVID-19, and uh, they have seen mixed uh, uh, mixed results through that. In the past, uh, for SARS and others, um, this kind of treatment, uh, especially when uh, when you know instead of trying to find new drug, they are trying to use the already approved drugs. To uh, to give relief to the to the patients uh, right now. That's what uh, they are trying to do, and they are seeing mixed results. Uh, mainly uh, uh, people with uh, a relatively stronger immune system. They are showing a very good uh, response to these drugs. Yeah. So that's all I had, um, Abhirendra. Hey, Harold. Thank you so much. This was very enlightening and very comprehensive drug and uh, complete uh, mitigation plan coverage you have given us. Uh, Thank you. Thanks for insight. I have a quick question for the entire panel now. So you have given us this uh, regenerator on the way they are doing. And if any of the panelists would want to take a shot on regenerator piece and quantum, and if that could make a headway faster, better, or if regenerator could be using some computing capabilities in the background, if anyone has that uh, insight or have stumbled upon any of that research, please feel free to share. Otherwise we can definitely go on further. And I have another very good data science uh, resource and an ACE person with us today, who's part of our uh, Gen team as well, Gen for Quantum team. And I would like to introduce him as well. But before that, I want to give the chance to the panel. If anyone wants to make any comments so far or share any Anything additional? Open to every, every panelist at this moment, please. I, I want to show something uh, since this was really very interesting information. Um, again, from the talk that I used already some of the slides I mentioned, there is a very interesting uh, picture about how the different uh, uh, countries were responding and how things are developing. Again, it's so quickly happening that it's very difficult uh, to see what is going on. Uh, but it's very easy once you see how you're tracking something else. Uh, can I share my screen? Uh, to, to be able to see what's going to be the future around yourself. Um, Absolutely, yeah. and we'll, after that, we'll definitely come to all the corporates, government, and everybody who's trying to contribute here. But absolutely, take it away. Yeah. Um, so, do, do you see this picture? Let's see if I can go full screen. So, I guess we you all can see it. Uh, you can see UK and different companies. Countries like Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, and Korea, um, they, I mean, they are still going up, but they are quite different behavior than most of the other countries. Uh, to me, my interesting question is what is going on with India? Uh, <laughs> why they are like that here uh, compared to, I mean, for the others, we have understanding. It will take a totally different stab at that, vessel, and just for the sake of interjecting here for a moment. The immunity level is so high in India, which could be the reason <laughs> you might see that curve come up much later. I'm just taking with my gut feel. I'm not saying that's the reason, but otherwise uh -huh. they've gone through all these uh, viruses and everything. And I, I see that as the only reason which is different. The immunity yeah. level is higher because of whatever circumstances and conditions are, which is a blessing. Yeah, I guess in so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. The alpha up there, yeah. Or, or no one is traveling from China to India. Uh, that is not true, though. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, please. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think they are not testing enough uh, people. And uh, yeah, and uh, in general, uh, there's a lot of um, other, uh, um, other diseases out there. So this is much smaller than that, I believe. And yeah, for the but you say Brazil thing. and Australia, you yeah. can understand because they are further away, so there wasn't enough people to travel back and forth there. 
another comment i have and bhara may agree with me or tony or even balaji may agree with me or any any other people who are on the forum from india so chloroquine or kunin malaria was a big thing in india and people used to take chloroquine kunin with any fever they had their bodies are enough pumped with chloroquine all these years which i know of going back at least 25 30 40 years to the extent yeah, that's true yeah and and to the extent that when the first time i was traveling to india and i was uh, at uh, my hospital to take travel shots and they said here is chloroquine and they said 15 dollars cost i said guys keep it if i really need it in 15 dollars i'll be able to buy so much chloroquine there which i can feed to the whole neighborhood it's so cheap there and literally i did not take any chloroquine i traveled and came back and oh. <laughs> Jivika is absolutely trying to say something. I'll give it to you, Jivika, if you want to say something here. Yeah. Actually, no, I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> oh, I, I thought your picture popped up, maybe. Oh, no, no, I don't know why. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, those are the reasons. I mean, they, they, I, I could be totally wrong, but I'm saying those are the things which could mm. be that they have a built-in immunity and resistance that could be by mistake by chance unintentionally helping but is that true proof is in the pudding we are yet to see if we get there at that time yeah. let's see months to six months it may be too early to declare anything or say anything so i will just rest my case here <laughs> over to you back to westland uh no that, that's what i wanted to show and share um okay. if anyone i guess now we are in the discussion right uh i have i have still one more piece to go because okay. i want to introduce definitely and give a chance because i have um, somebody who is very brilliant with us today and he's part of our team as i mentioned earlier uh -huh. tony m for the sake of butchering not his last name i'm using tony m and he is the top 6% contributor for open source code ai ml practitioner as well as into quantum and he has been working with us and with you also professor and he wants to take us next to couple of things in data science as well so if you could give me back control i want to just take him there for the slides and he can share with us and also he's going to show us john hopkins as our next segment we will be trying to see what is going on from government side corporate side and academia where i'll bring you back for mit slide as well so i want to just give that chance to tony and let me share that here well thank you for andra so let me, let me just start off let me do it up for you okay sure so that you get to this here and i will just cover quickly this is our segment but tony will cover this data segment data science segment also with and then on this side as well so this is the first slide again tony shared and i'll let tony speak to this slide before tony you jump into your john hopkins dashboard please sure give you what's going on with nvd and what is their call out so first of all thank you to all the panelists i think we've set up the stage for a very very uh, engaging discussion um we we've, we've heard several different angles uh, from the quantum side as well as the data science side and I'd like to share my screen really, really quick. Um, I believe someone was talking about, you know, so, oh, hey, Brenda, can you, can I have the ability to share my screen? You want to use this or you want to just show the straight? Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna show, share my screen. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. So there, there's quite a number of things I'd like to talk about. And, one of that is, is you know, as um, Rebecca and Vinay has touched on, is uh, at the protein level, at the RNA and DNA level. So something to appreciate in the world of quantum is the physics of it. Uh, when you get down to the protein level, the nano level, the RNA and DNA level, the physics are completely different to what we acknowledge in our day-to-day -day world. So this is a quick video um, in terms of like the actual simulation, you know, with the spike protein. 
uh, et cetera. This is something to appreciate that computer simulations are able to do now. Unknown cause detected in Wuhan, China on the 31st of December 2019. Today we know that the infectious agent was a virus of the coronavirus family, which was named SARS-CoV-2, that causes a respiratory disease termed COVID-19. This virus has not only received widespread media coverage, but also caught the attention of scientists who have been busy analyzing the virus, the disease it causes and how it spreads. There is already an enormous amount of information available about the virus, and that is why we thought to summarize some of the information in this video. First of all, what do we know about the virus? Coronaviruses received their name from their appearance in electron micrographs where the pronounced spike-like protrusions create the effect of a corona, Latin for crown. The genetic material inside the coronavirus is RNA, and the entire genome is almost 13,000 bases long, packed together with a nuclear protein into the viral particle or virion. For the virus to replicate, however, it needs to insert its RNA into cells and hijack the cellular machinery to produce new viruses. On its surface, the virion contains three main proteins, the envelope, the hemagglutinin esterase, and the spike protein. These are embedded into the lipid bilayer. The large spike protein is responsible for the crown-like protrusions, but it also recognizes the corresponding receptors in human cells called ACE2. The protease ACE2 mediates the cleavage of the spike protein, which then releases an epitope, enabling the subsequent fusion of the virus with the human cell. So that was, that was a really nice video to kind of really show you the 3D, 4D structure of at this, something that we can't see with our own naked eye. Um, something else I'd like to jump into a little bit is the actual code, right? So if you re re remember from um, your uh, preschool and high school biology and chemistry uh, classes, your genetic makeup is, done through genetic sequence is, is literally biological mapping and code, right? So your RNA and DNA make up your individual being, whether it's a human, monkey, or in this case, even a virus. Um, and Rebecca mentioned earlier uh, that there are lots of data sets available. So this is GIS aid, which is uh, international collaboration, which is essentially the database. It, it's an open access to everyone. So the corporations, the academic researchers, as well as the public-private partnerships are pretty much day by day uploading data sets uh, to this database. Something I'd like to point out is that this one researcher um, made this really cool dashboard, dashboard and he was able to uh, map out the evolution of the strains, how the strain is evolving. Now, literally just a few days ago, I saw about 500 something uh, genomes, and that was just on Wednesday. Mind you, these genome samplings are people who have tested and uh, allowed to submit, and this is done through uh, a, uh, a, a, what is it? Uh, using the taking a swab from the nose really and so you take you take a swab from someone's nose and you extract the rna in the sample and then determine the letters of this rna genome using chemistry and powerful cameras so you could i'll, I'll, I'll put this uh in the chat if anyone would like to take a look at this it's very cool stuff so this slide is in the deck guys it'll be there for you okay great and so this, this researcher, and he's a computational biologist, he's actually taking the data from GSI-8 and he's mapping out uh, the day-to-day -day evolution. This is just a tree of the evolution, so the epidemiology. Uh, this is very something cool to look at. Another cool thing to look at um, that Byra was mentioning is how the evolution has taken place. And now Johns Hopkins has the latest uh, data sets and they're kind of aggregating all the data sets. So this is something great to uh, look at as well if you want to keep track 
you are right. It seems like we are following uh, Italy's trajectory. Now, something to keep in mind when analyzing and looking at the numbers is that many of the experts are saying that this coronavirus is very similar to your normal influenza, the flu. However, the death rates are roughly one and a half to two percent. But mind you that the numbers may not be so accurate. Why? There could be a lot of healthy individuals who contract it and then recover. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at the data, when you're looking at the numbers, because I personally believe the death rates could be on an actual realistic scale could be much, much less. So this, this is a cool dashboard where you can kind of go by countries, state and province and seeing how many cases were confirmed. And this is getting updated around the clock, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's like 24 seven up today. If we want to zoom in, we can yeah. check out how California is doing. Have to that link in the chat, right, Tony? Yes. Thank you. And, and Tony, I wanted to give a little shout out to this one too. I think they actually put their code for this up on GitHub. So if you wanted to download and, and run it and modify it yourself and get access to these streams, you could. They do, they do. Um, so I'm actually gonna be talking about some of these open source collaborations that are going on. And now that I'm done with my work week, this is something that I'll be shifting focus to over the weekend. I like to be a little more hands-on. Um, so yeah, definitely take a look at this dashboard. And, and I'm glad you mentioned this, Rebecca. So there is something that I'm keeping track of and that is Folding at Home. Folding at Home is an initiative started by NVIDIA as well as Professor Pandy, uh, who was over at Stanford, but recently stepped out of Stanford, but still has a presence at Stanford. And he's probably the expert when it comes to computational biology, um, simulating protein folding. And whether it's Regeneron or the startup at Cambridge Moderna uh, or, or Gilead, everyone is essentially using the same framework, using the same methodology to tackle these problems. Uh, right now, since quantum computers aren't, you know, it's only near term and they're, they're a few years away, if not a decade away, people are, the, the latest researchers and companies are using uh, advancements in GPUs to simulate as well as run simulations and, and modeling as well as the, um, the, the receptor binding for the protein structure. Um, so actually just recently, uh, folding at home so NVIDIA has opened up to the world to really donate your uh, unused GPUs whether it's for gaming or for research to dedicate to a distributed network of computers that you know hey while I'm sleeping or while I'm not really using this powerful computer I can at least use it for a good cause so if you're interested in that definitely take a look at this github um, Something I, I also like to point out is, you know, some of the research that's being done in the open source world. So Folding at Home has a GitHub repo. Uh, there's another repo done with um, Next Train, which was that uh, dashboard of the mapping of the genome evolution, the genetic evolution. And there's a couple of other ones that are, are good to keep an eye on. But I did want to take just a quick deep dive on how you know, the mechanics and the data science is actually done. Um, I think that might interest some people here. So um, as Barb was mentioning that Regeneron and uh, some of the companies are focusing on the spike protein and believe it or not, uh, several of the militaries have been doing uh, dedicated research into this for years, if not decades. So some of these companies were able to leverage off of prior research, uh, research. That's why they're coming to, you know, quick advancements and quick trials and clinicals. Um, this is this is something cool. So, oops. if I go, so for your reference, if you go into this um, repo, you click system preparation. You can find all the different strains that uh, the researchers are essentially uploading, putting in as input. And, and running models off of that. So this is a good one where, I believe this is the one for pro, with the protein. 
uh, with okay. the spike protein. So this is an example with the spike protein. So if you're just curious just to see how like the RNA is sequenced and how the data actually looks like, it's this, it's, it's this, this is it. Awesome, I think this is very relevant and very helpful, Tony. Thank you so very much. Yes. And I, I know we have, we, we can go on on this side for hours. Mm -hmm. So for the sake of uh, we are, our time, we, we are left with our 15 minutes. So at this stage, I want to bring in Balaji also. He mentioned something about Amazon. Balaji, can you hop on? Can, I, can I say something really, really quick? Just yeah. want to finish up with one note. Um, as many of you realize that vaccines could be a year, year and a half away. However, um, this one researcher, I believe he's the one who was behind uh, next strain, that mapping of the genetic evolution of the virus. Um, I think what you're going to see in the coming weeks, the news will break out how plasma will actually be very, very big in the short term um, novelty to coming up with a solution for this problem. So basically, when you cover when you cover from a viral disease, you have in your blood what are called neutralizing antibodies. These are antibodies that kill the virus. Once you recover, the plasma can be taken from donors. It's very safe. The same thing as using as a blood donation, except they don't take the red blood cells, they take the liquid. They take the plasma itself and it acts like a drug. And it could be used for the prevention of infection for people who are being exposed, or it could be used for therapy. And this week on Wednesday, um, I think it was, so, so it's called Stop the Gap. Okay, so this, this idea of stopping the gap, stopping uh, you might hear flatten the curve, and and pretty soon I think you're going to hear stop the gap. Um, so yeah, actually, yeah. just this went this this few days ago on Wednesday, Johns Hopkins and some of these researchers have uh, put up documentation in front of the FDA to start using this plasma uh, substance for clinical trials. I think it'll be passed very quickly. So, with that said, thank you for the spotlight. Hey, and that's all done. No, Tony, this is very useful. Thank you so much. I'm glad you could share this with us. Uh, you give me the control back. I want to see if uh, Balaji can provide a quick uh, detail on the Amazon thing. We may not have a slide, but Balaji, you want to speak to that? Uh, actually, I saw just uh, before the meeting, I just saw Amazon giving the uh, processing um, cloud uh, for machine learning for millions to provide it, but I'm accurately, I'm not um, able to provide the data, but I just read about it, but uh, I'm, I have to read that in full uh, later I will provide. And uh, I want to communicate one of the aspects of this virus, how it evolved. I mean, I feel uh, it is 19 is the version, like my software, it is evolving from two to 19. I heard it is a mutation. So why this mutation occurs, I feel this is the uh, reason uh, behind is the pollution part. Um, the uh, ozone layer is getting eroded. Because of that, the sun rays can, I mean, actually the sun rays affects the uh, genome, uh, genetic matter basically. And uh, that can mo modify the existing organism to mutate. <laughs> So a basic cause we are not approaching, we are just uh, trying to prevent and uh, treat. We are not going back, what causes it? Basically it is the pollution I feel. And uh, also the race in India, uh, it is in the Mediterranean, uh, there is a equatorial line going on. So the India position is uh, in a position where the sun rays comes in a different angle, which can be possible it kills the virus, I think. So that is my uh, just assumption, but it may be true why India is not uh, that much virus um, prolification happens because the sun rays are having some impact on it. At the same time, the um, ozone layer is um, depleted that can uh, help, I mean, help this big uh, bugs to grow because this mutation helps them to adapt to the drug uh, and evolve more and more. And uh, so from, uh, that's why the uh, mutated number is given 19, because it is muted to 19 version. Fair enough. No, I think that's very, very interesting information. Thank you, Balaji, for sharing that with us.
Okay, so I think uh, Tony has already covered uh, this uh, NVIDIA call for help and gaming pieces and the graphical power if you can share with them. And uh, of course, in terms of uh, other companies and the way this thing has been happening on European Commission, NSF, all of them are coming out with money, Oak Ridge leadership, all these um, corporates, lab, like Admissia, they are all trying to come together to help. So, and I want to speak, have Professor speak one more time if I want to cover quickly on this MIT technology. We are with the last 10 minutes and then we want to wrap up with the final thought. And before that, we have to do Q&A for the audience as well. There are some good questions. Right. Thank you, Balaji. That's a great discussion. Um, and you can see that there are variety of resources uh, that have been employed to combat the virus. Um, this one interesting thing is if you look at the current data, you'll see that the last few days, there were more than uh, 20,000, uh, a big jump uh, in the cases that were detected. Uh, and I think it's mostly just because there is more and more testing and confirmed cases. Um, and this is a specifically interesting thing is that there is a diagnostic of the virus on something which is very simple uh, technology, uh, similar to like a testing you can do at home. Uh, so that's one of the things that I, I found it's amazing. And I guess we'll see much more similar technology coming up for testing for different uh, viruses and bacteria in the future. Uh, can I go to the next slide? So that was maybe, uh, Virinda, that was your to cover. Yeah. That was your last slide, Professor, the one which we used. Hmm? Unless we have, you can speak to something if you still want to add, but uh, that, that's all yeah. I had. Well, I think it's also similar, man. You're having the status and all the other things. These, these uh, are we in terms, yeah. We're coming to that in section. Mm -hmm. okay. You can go ahead, cover it. Yeah. yeah. In terms of how quantum can help, um, clearly, I mean, quantum is just a baby yet, and you cannot expect this baby, even if it grows up to be an athlete and a champion, uh, to do anything uh, right now. Uh, although there could be some uh, amazing results that would come out from Google or Intel, certainly that they will kind of mobilize and find a way to utilize the resources that they have. But my point here is to show that really quantum is out there. Uh, there's a lot of resources that are available and uh, people can try to explore this and uh, learn more about quantum physics and how to use quantum computers. Um, and the next slide is probably a summary of the possible applications. Um, so we today covered the health. Um, that's kind of critical thing that we see definitely uh, for finding new um, medical <coughs> treatments. Uh, in the future, finance is going to be kind of interesting to think, uh, analyzing how the measures that were imposed uh, on businesses and restrictions affected uh, the financial sector of our society. And uh, naturally computing and space, these are things that we would like to understand. Uh, but I think that one important thing that we have to keep in mind that uh, the real application of the quantum may be actually in art and style, because once computers take over most of the things we do, what is left for us to do but art and live in style, right? So that's probably where we would employ the most the role of these quantum computers in the future. So with this, that was pretty much all I had to say about quantum computing um, and its relevance to the current uh, virus situation. Perfect, thank you so much, Professor. I think uh, with that, we'll try to come to this slide where we are talking about uh, clinical phase one trials, they have begun in Seattle, there are bold actions going on to prevent the spreading of virus, innovating segmenting of millennials, seniors, and elders, and different times for shopping for seniors and elderly people. All these are very, very bold steps and very fair steps to prevent it from spreading. 
And of course, today's news was totally different that even uh, people around age of 40 may not be safe. So things, it's, it's a moving target and obviously we'll see some uh, kind of similar solutions and kind of uh, measures coming up. And of course, uh, we have seen in India, they have put some restrictions on gathering as well. Italy is locked down, China is locked down even to the extent that in Wuhan, people are not restricted to their residential complex only. Those things are going on. And uh, someone said very, very clearly that this is something where it happened and it could uh, go from that angle a little more severe. So those are yeah. the things. And uh, well, with that, I know there is a Q&A and we have time very quickly for at least two, three questions. I know some questions have been going on, some comments have been going yes, on. on I, I see that Sam is asking to see the slide about the hardware and software on QC. Just the previous slide before the question and answers. Um, this one? This one, right? No, 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 go, go back to uh, this one. Yeah, is that the one you want? Uh, or probably you can unmute. Uh, no, no, next one. Uh, we're in the, I think it's next slide, right? And probably some can, uh, you can unmute some and he can say his question right away. Yeah, I think Balaji, can you please unmute for the sake of time? And then any final comments we'll take from the panelists after that. Uh, yes. Thank you, Balaji. I mean, you have a question, please go ahead, ask your question directly. Hello? Are you still there? Or you're on mute. You may have muted yourself as well. Anybody, any questions? Audience, please. So um, I had a question, Virendra, for uh, Vinay. Please, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, Vinay, thank you for showing that flowchart, and it was quite intriguing to me uh, for the ML, uh, like hybrid model of ML versus uh, quantum uh, ML that you were showing. So do you have any um, a link or documentation, or was it your original work uh, that you were showing? Uh, if you can just uh, put, in, put in a reference uh, for that, uh, it was very intriguing to me. Yeah. Yeah, sure. The the flow chart is actually my creation, but uh, it's basically based on a generalized workflow of many projects. So uh, I have some demonstrations of some Penny Lane uh, Zenedu projects. So if you want, I'll send you the documentation. Yeah, that'll be very helpful. Yeah, yeah. I'll connect with you offline. Thank you. Yeah, sure. And Bharav, you already have... Uh... Harav, you already have Vinay's uh, email already. Yes, I do. Yeah, uh, I can I can connect with him on LinkedIn or something. Yeah, yeah. but I will find find the email also. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, one final call for all our panelists. Uh, if there are no more questions, uh, and who would like to go first, please? Yeah, I have a question about the virus. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Please yeah, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, the question was like how the mutation of the virus is happening. Is it something that is mutating itself exactly how it is or it is decaying their mutations every time it mutates? There must be some kind of aging happening to that, right, of the mutation. Is question for whom? I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry, maybe Tony, yeah, right? Uh, Tony, explain. Uh, Okay. No, we may, I think, right? Uh, Tony, we want to take it up. Sorry, what was the question? The question was, how is the viral um, lifespan is? Like, is it going to mutate itself to death? Or is it going to be there forever, like other viral infections we have? Okay, so in terms of the mutation rate, it seems like it goes through 
roughly two strains a month. So 24 on a yearly basis, it may mutate with 24 strains. And that is in line with about influenza flu rates mutation. So it's not abnormal. So it's going to stay for a long time now, right? Well, just like the flu has been sticking around, I mean, what will end up happening in the future is that there will be a vaccine because they'll stick around. Okay. okay. So the blockers, blockers, uh, uh, something is blocker you said about blockers that those are like a, a moisturizer or something that we can put it in moisturizer and cover ourselves, like uh, repellents or something that we have to eat and then becomes part of the body. Okay, yes. Yeah. So actually there is someone in this audience who could speak further on that, Professor Ed. Professor Ed Katz, he mentioned that earlier in this week, he heard from someone that one of the best things you can do is rolling up your sleeves and washing your hands and arms under warm, hot soap water. Mm -hmm. and there's, there's an ingredient in the soap that kills this um, instantly. If I can break in, Tony. Yes, yes, go ahead. Please, please Ed. Uh, so uh, this is on a radio program with a PhD in um, ethnobiotic, I don't remember, but he was, he was an expert in this field and knew exactly what he was talking about. And he says the absolute best thing for the average person to do is to roll up your sleeves, wash your hands thoroughly, and wash your forearms thoroughly as if you were about to go into surgery yourself and perform the surgery. Because there's something in normal soap that uh, does something to the, the virus uh, membrane, the outer membrane, and uh, it, uh, it breaks the membrane and the, the virus just simply falls apart. Right. Um, that, that's one thing. The other thing is obviously keeping social distancing. Yeah. And how much is practically social distancing means? Like what I one uh, video that I heard, I saw that um, people were saying the viral infection travels through the droplets of water. Like when somebody is talking and he's, his mouth, uh, the fumes coming out from mouth, that may carry the virals and then when you inhale it it comes to your body or if you touch uh, that uh, person that viral comes into the next person is that true or uh, is it something that is uh, you know some if you touch some furniture and the same furniture if i touch i get the viral infection how does it really travel i mean um i mean what we are doing social distancing and all of that looks like a little bit off, a little bit more than what is really needed, right? Or is it something absolutely needed what you are doing now? Because I'm seeing people in Costco or Walmart, they are functioning, I mean, they are doing it, but is it safe to go to Walmart? And then, you know, people are like two, three feet away, uh, of course, they are not coughing or they are not sneezing, but um, is it really safe to walk into those shops? One meter is what I heard should be the safe distance which should be kept from others. Uh, but I want to say that for, for social distance, what they mean really is the elderly people like 70 and older to distance themselves from the, the, the families in a sense that uh, young kids can bring home and they, they can get the grandpa and the grandma sick uh, and, and without knowing it. Uh, so that's why I hear that uh, many uh, people in Europe, actually, the elderly people, that they go in their villas or separate them so that, that they stay away from their family. Um, it, of course, could be very difficult for elderly people that need regular kind of care. Uh, but that, that's uh, one other thing, the, the aspect of that uh, in social distance is how you separate between uh, different groups of people. But the so, meteorology that, you know, Walmart or Costco's are maintaining, is it safe? I mean, it, can we go to the shop and buy stuff like food and other thing, or we should just mail order it? So there's a few things no, to I, your question. I it's think, like multi-part. 
one, one is like our regular way of living is just okay. I mean, the the thing is that you you don't have guarantee whatever you do that I mean, it, it, you can avoid it hundred uh, percent. Only precaution. Yeah. So to jump in really quick, right? Um, if you do go to Walmart or any of these things, you should take preventative message uh, uh, precautions. Uh, not only social distancing or staying six feet away, but you know if you could wear some sort of mask or something, right? That will allow much less rate of contraction. In terms of this whole social distancing and not leaving your home is that you must have seen some of these charts and graphs is that if you do come in contact, you will only, you, you become a node essentially, you become a connecting point and you can transmit it to other people. Right. Um, and another point to one of your earlier questions is like, when it, this thing is that it will only go airborne if someone is coughing or sneezing. Oh. And since some of these buildings are airplanes, they are recirculating that air, uh, that leads to greater transmission rates. So that's why there's these huge, you know, warnings don't go out and travel just because traveling is probably the, the easiest way to um, transmit this. So remind you that this is an invisible agent. Um, you might be skeptical, but do take heed, do take warning. You don't wanna, you wanna play it safe. You really wanna play it safe. And the more people that do their part that stay indoors. And actually one of my friends today, he said, don't even step outside your house. His friend just got fined four hundred dollars for going out to like Home Depot or something and buying flowers. The the police officer handed her a four hundred dollar ticket. So this is serious. Everyone has to do their part. Stay indoors. Only go out for you know emergencies and you know buying buying groceries. Yeah, I know that was something I was afraid of. Uh, but uh, yeah, we got to do what you got to do. But I think uh, mail ordering grocery would be the better way because uh, then only those people coming from the shops will be like from the shops will be coming out and then dropping the food to your house. So that would be much better. Uh, I, I'm trying to another, do that now. Another thing is I realized in terms of the transmission, right, in contact, right? So in areas that have high humidity, since, you know, the coughing or sneezes will create these water droplets, right? So the virus will be sticking around longer on objects and on surfaces and places that have higher humidity. So caution if you live in California, you know, as we head into turbulent weather or, you know, more rainy season, um, that's something to be even be more cautious of. So our, our climate isn't even the same where we wouldn't, we wouldn't have to be too worried. But yeah, if you're at the gas station, people are saying at the gas station, be cautious because there are a lot of people, a lot of people coming from all over the place where the handle that you're holding, you know, the, it can't live for too long, but if that window is there, so, you know, you pull up right after another person filled up, chances are, you know, there could be microbes or something that's something so invisible, uh, it could be lingering around and you can, you can contract it. Hmm. All right. So yeah. I think we are over by a few minutes. Uh, Let's gear it back to our uh, expert panelists. If you have any final comments, otherwise uh, we, we can give a final. I just want to jump in and... Dr. Jivika, you want to say something? Oh, this is Rebecca. I did just want to throw in there. I kind of gave a high level, um, rush through a high level uh, details, but I forgot to mention the use cases that we were actually working on. At quantum thought um i've got some some related directly related is we're actually uh co-authoring a um, project proposal using location data um and quantum optimization to um to understand how like social transmission works um and then a couple others that we've been working on for a while are actually using quantum I'm computing in classical computing for hybrid uh, computer vision as applied to medical imaging. And also on uh, some of this molecular simulation stuff. So if you're interested in any of that, feel free to reach out to me directly. And Rebecca, if you want to send that information before we circulate our information here, we'll be more than happy to include that as well 
as part of your slide or something. We can add it there and then circulate it. Please shoot it to us so everybody gets it. Perfect. We'll do it. Thank you very much. So I will I will go in the right round robin. Uh, any final comments, uh, Vesselin? No, uh, I think it was really very interesting uh, discussion, very fruitful, and uh, there's a lot of interesting information. Um, uh, uh, how thank are we going to ask everyone for comments. coming? Yeah, Haro, go ahead, please. Thank you so much, yeah. Haro, go ahead, please. How are we going to share the slides that were shown today? Uh, uh, absolutely, be we have recording. Haro will be sharing recording as well as this deck which was put together. The full right, deck thank you. will be able to get that, yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah. Any any comments, Bharav, before we wrap up? Yeah, I mean, this is very fascinating. Um, I mean, this is the whole group is uh, quite, uh, quite uh, you know, knowledgeable. And uh, thank you for the opportunity, Virendra and Rab Balaji. Thank you for being with us today. Absolutely. Thank it you. was, uh, I mean, we say, we say in the, COVID-19 since flights are empty, today flight was absolutely full. And every single, expert, every single panelist made it happen. And with that, I include Tony as well in that list. Absolutely. And our participants uh, and audience, you guys made it really go well. And with that, I would like to invite Dr. Jivika for some of your final comments as well. Yeah, actually, thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed being part of this. and. Uh, uh, also, I learned a lot from all those experts that joined the panel discussion. Mm -hmm. But uh, just as a final thought, I think, uh, uh, I mean, right now we've been uh, going through this for more than a week now. And I think Corona is telling us to kind of slow down our lives. And it's giving us a chance uh, to stop the kind of the rat race that we've been experiencing all this time. Maybe we should uh, sit back and think uh, uh, the reason that we are doing all these things that we've been we have been doing basically and probably to take a break and spend some time with uh, uh, some quality time with the loved ones and also if you have time and if you're not very familiar with the quantum computing maybe this is the, uh, the chance for you to get familiar with uh, all the uh, wonderful things that the qubits are offering and how we could harness the power of quantum computing uh, to make the impossible possible, you know? So this, these are my final thoughts. I thought I would share. Awesome, very, very, very good ones. Thank you so much, Jivika. And uh, I want to invite Rebecca for the final comment, Rebecca, one more time. Sure, yeah. Um, I, I want to encourage everybody who hasn't tried, uh, I, I speak a lot on AI and ethics, and I think this, this falls pretty squarely into um, uh, an ethical use of technology. So I want to encourage anyone out there who's kind of scared to try out some of this stuff, just jump in and use, use uh, some of these resources and open source that we talked about today. Um, feel free to reach out and, and just go for it. We all need to be involved and, and take responsibility for making the world a better place. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And Vinay, you are next. And I want to tell all the audience as well as our panels. Vinay has been with us from India and Vinay has been with us at all odd times because of the time zones and difference. Thank you, Vinay, for accommodating that as well. While you had to talk to me, go back and forth, we worked on the slides, whatever way, you have been always very accommodative and very knowledgeable. Please go ahead, Vinay, with your final comments. Uh, definitely, it's always been a pleasure like, talking to an audience like you. And uh, definitely, I am a more uh, deliverables kind of guy. So if you can work on something, create an output, and then uh, like iterate on it, then that is the best approach. And I guess this is what came out really well in this discussion, where we had mm -hmm. different professionals who are talking about their own domain and the entire idea of the having quantum computers in a workflow of creating a vaccine was excellent and the definitely a lot of things to learn and an excellent uh, excellent session indeed thanks thank you so much thank you vinay and last but not the least tony please go ahead with final comment all right so first of all i just want to thank all the panelists for coming out it was a great discussion very enlightening um other than that i just wanted to give a 
great appreciation to all the healthcare workers out there. So family, friends, loved ones, if they're out there, they're, they're on the front line. So really, really do appreciate all the work they're doing. And with that, I want to personally thank each and every panelist because we picked up this topic on Sunday, last Sunday, and we are into Friday today. You guys made it happen. And it was not because of anything else but sheer your commitment and the right positivity and everything that you were all there. And thank you so very much. And as I said, AI people are always kind of afraid we are taking AI to the quantum dimension, ethical use. Let's keep it seen, let's keep it positive, let's keep it in the right direction and use it for the betterment of the mankind. With that, I will close out today's session, but with the final word to And I'm planning to have a second session of this if we anybody interested to participate in uh, maybe a week or uh, next week. Uh, we can do a second part of this uh, as the response was good. Uh, people are staying two weeks uh, home, so they have enough time uh, to uh, accumulate more information now. So uh, we can plan for the second part of it, mm, I feel. My suggestion is that let's give it a some time, some lead time, so that we have some new and good information to compile and share, rather than That's staying a week right. after again in a hurry like this. Because the COVID is uh, another quantum machine itself. It is evolving and it's spreading faster than us. We have to show it. Right. Um, I mean, I agree there. I, that's I said. Let's give it a two weeks time. But I would like to have a vote with the panel here if, if you think we want to come back next week, same time. And if you're not kind of, uh, speaking, can you please put yourself on mute? So let, let's see. Are we going to play it as a year? And we can definitely go for the second session. Absolutely second is on the time and scheduling. We should all come together and make it very productive. And we want to uh, see how much more of technology as well as COVID-19 we want to discuss in that as well. Because the, the next, next chapter will be very, very focused. And we want to see where we want to go for the focus. And as Wesleyan also had mentioned, we had different areas for future and we have other pieces of so we have to continue this. It's a great group emerging. Let's continue this effort and absolutely continue to march. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much everyone. Good Thanks. night. Thank everyone. you everyone. Have a great night. Stay, Stay safe. Stay, Stay safe guys. Flatten the curve. <laughs> Thank you yeah. guys. Thank you very Bye. much for everyone. Bye attendees, team, and everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, Mayro, are you still on? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay, yeah. So I thought of uh, continuing this. So, you uh, the Vinay's number you were asking me. Yeah, so you got that? Yeah, I... Yeah, I got it, sir. Thank you. Oh, okay. So we thought of having the... Uh, Second part, if you are interested, we can uh, do it in a couple of weeks or if you're interested to participate. Yeah, let's do it. I'm all for it. Okay, nice. Um, yeah, let's, uh, you have to decide which topic may be COVID only, but different angle we have to see how we can. Uh, yes, yes, sounds good. So, yeah, thanks for uh, coming on time and uh, I was worried uh, because you had uh, issues there and uh, you had to come, I thought, uh, leaving those. Anyway, um, it was a nice uh, discussion and uh, I'll send the video and uh, other um, things. Uh, Virendra, you are still there on?
thing is neutral. Okay. All right, uh, guys, thank you.